Hey, everybody, welcome to Podcast for Me, the podcast about film, culture, politics, and Clint Eastwood, where we watch every film directed by and or starring American filmmaker Clint Eastwood and explore how they speak to their moment. And this one uh, show is hosted by two guys. I'm one of the guys. My name is Jake Serwin. I'm one of the guys. My name is Ian Ryan. How are you doing, Jake? I got a surprise for you, buddy. Oh. Oh, no, no. you're still one of the guys. Uh, I'm doing weird, ongoing uh, respiratory weirdness. Mm -hmm. How are you? I'm doing fine. It's a, we're we're doing a night record. Yeah. So I'd like to Podcast challenge myself nights. to bring an even sleepier energy than normal. Which <laughs> <laughs> yeah. seems improbable, even, but I think I'll do it. It's lower somehow. Uh-huh. Let's bring our guest in, see how she feels about the energy in the room. Our guest today is a writer and podcaster, creator of the terrific podcast Heidi World, and if I may say so, future poet laureate of the San Fernando Valley. Uh, Molly Lambert, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Now, I looked this up. Los Angeles has a poet laureate. Did you guys know about Mm -hmm. this? Didn't. I didn't know. Who is it? Yeah, it's a woman named Lynn Thompson. She's a poet and she's the poet laureate. And then I was looking up, apparently you have to apply for this. Did you guys know this? Mm, It's like a Hollywood walk of fame. Kind of embarrassing. Yeah, exactly. You like submit your resume. Is that, do you know if that's, did like Robert Frost have to do that? I always wonder about that. Yeah. To be a Nepo baby of other Yeah. Poets. Well, I know like, yeah, with the, with the, the star on the Walk of Fame, it's like $50,000 or something. And they say, hey, do you want to pay for this? And then you get to say yes or no. And then like Disney paid for Minnie Mouse's star on the Walk of Fame. Do you remember that? Katy Perry sort of stood in for Minnie. Is that true? That's real, yeah. She was like dressed as Minnie Mouse. Okay. The whole to do. <laughs> yeah, it's pay for play. Yeah, exactly. John Waters just got one and people were like, how did John Waters got right. one? And it's like, oh, because the Academy Museum's doing the show about right. him. It was a whole thing. They clearly paid for it. He's the only person on earth who understands like what's funny about getting a Hollywood Walk right. of Fame star, yep. which is yeah. that people step on it. <laughs> yeah. And... It was right in front of Larry Edmonds' bookshop. He got like prime real yeah. estate. Yeah, pretty good. Mm. Yeah, and then there's like Great corner. Oh, there's like the the people who are like right on the gutter or something are like in front of that yeah. awful pizza place. Yeah, great town. Lo- love this town. Beautiful Wonderful town. town. <laughs> That's what we call it. The beautiful town. <laughs> the beautiful town. <laughs> That's what it means in Spanish. Yeah, Hollywood means <laughs> the beautiful town. How you doing, Molly? How you How you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I just watched Blood Work. I can't lie to you. I've been okay. putting it off. That's fine. So but you must much. be feeling elated. I can't. I'm, I'm so ready film. to go to talk about okay. it. This Raring. is actually the best Love thing because usually I wait too long between watching something and talking yeah. about it. And this is the best okay. way to do it. It's like it's fresh in my brain. Right. I'm 100% going to forget all of it by tomorrow. Good. Great. Now's the time. Let's strike while the iron is hot. But you're correct. Those of us who have seen the film more than one day ago, we have already forgotten everything we ever wanted to say about the film. So. Oh. I'm going to bring the energy level to this podcast that Clint Eastwood brings to blood work, Oh, which is medium. Well, he's playing a man who's recovering. You're going to be kind of worrisome the whole podcast. His heart rate can't go right, above. He can't raise his voice like, too much or something might right. happen. Exactly. Well, he's got those weird, he's got the whole scar. We'll get into it really quickly. We got to start off with our, at this point, exhausting and stupid segment, the two questions. I actually have a great one. Oh, I have a not great one. So can I go first? Okay. Yeah, let's actually, we've never done this before where we, we let the guests like live their life and just <laughs> we prepare for the show. So Ian, why don't you go first and then I'll go next. Great. Now, Molly, you used to be employed as a type of a Fraser Crane figure, answering calls and providing wisdom to people. So you've, you've been exposed to all types. In this film, well, it's about a profiler and we, we get yeah. to sort of stereotype in a socially acceptable way. So I'm going to ask, this is for both of you guys, but I'm curious, Molly, if you've ever had any professional contact with a boat person. What do we think about boat people? Oh, oh my God. God. I have a lot of thoughts about boat people. Great. Well, le- I, I won't answer this. Uh, Molly, I'll let you go first, but I will just say some of what you say might hurt someone else's feelings on the show. So just, uh, <laughs> but you go first, say whatever you were going to say before. I am pro boat people. Okay, thank God. Mm. Yeah, of course. No, I like the houseboat mm. lifestyle. I like that it's in so many private eye things. I like that yeah. this was a houseboat, I think, in Long Beach is where they shot yeah. the movie, which made yeah. me yes. assume it took place in Long Beach. I think I have a fantasy of being a boat person. I would never disparage boat people. I don't know that I do know any. 
Mm. Can we even really know a boat person? You well, know? that's, I think, sort of the idea, the whole idea. I think it's thematically relevant to the film. You know, yep. it's a sort of a semi mooring. I long to be a boat person. I aspire to boat personhood <laughs> for all the reasons you mentioned, Molly. There's a kind of a private eye vibe to it. It's interesting. The, the movies that make me most want to be a boat person are like this and Double Jeopardy. And I think on in the movie Murder by Numbers, uh, Sandra Bullock lives yeah. on a house. So these are all movies where murder is very close to you. And yet I want to be a boat person. On Night Call, we had a, an erotic thriller bingo card right, that right. Emily Yoshida made. And it was like, Houseboat was definitely on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This isn't so much an erotic thriller, but... Well, it, they're never unerotic with Clint, <laughs> yeah, in a way. We see huh? some... We see some some gaping chest scars. Yeah, a few we, times. Sure do. we sure do. Yeah, I, I want to clarify. Also, I have not seen the acclaimed 1982 Anne Hui film Boat People, but it's supposed to be very good. It's on my list. Just want to shout her out and come on the show. But also, I do know, or I did know, a boat person because my grandfather. My this is the grandfather that nobody was like that crazy about, and now he's dead. It's fine. <laughs> he was a boat salesman in Marina del Rey for a while. And my other grandfather had a boat in Marina del Rey in the Jewish Yacht Club, in the wow. Del Rey Yacht Club, wow, which was like designated the yacht club. as the Jewish Yacht Club. And they had a little library there where I can't confirm, but if, if Bloodwork wasn't on the shelf, somebody was doing something wrong. <laughs> it was like all of Jimmy Buffett's books. He were, you know, Buffett wrote a couple of like... I'm not familiar with this part of his Rest life. Power. No. He, he wrote a, a couple of detective books like this and then also a memoir called A Pirate Looks at 40. That was just off the dome. And I don't remember what the other one... There's like a, a pirate is still writing books or whatever is the sequel. But <laughs> anyway. A pirate looks again. Would love to become mm -hmm. a boat person. Yeah, I feel like there's, there's two kinds of boat people... There's like rich boat people and yeah. poor yes. boat people. This is the key distinction. Well, there's, I, think. I think there's like boat on top of your house people and then there's boat and no house people in a way, right? Yeah. There's yeah. like country club boats. Yeah. And then like like hillbilly boat people. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, pontoon people. Yeah. Pontoon people. Lake. Lake. Lake boat people. Dwellers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With like a or river boat. The ultimate off the grid boat person i think yeah i was just getting tiktoks for somebody who lives off the grid in in a house on the water oh yeah it's like mm. the i guess the house is a boat because it's floating right but yeah. it was like i've seen some of these videos a couple of kind of like off the grid hippie type of preppers yeah and they're like once a month floating. They, they kayak into town to get like the one thing they can't yeah. grow yeah yeah. It looks like mm -hmm. they kayak in all the time mm -hmm. and have cats and the cats come in the kayaks with them. Ooh, wow. That's nice. Wow. So they have little cat lifeboats or lifeboat life jackets. I've seen those, the cat life jacket. <laughs> I would like to see a cat lifeboat, however. That would be incredible. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, little tubes. <laughs> Ian, we actually got a we got an email from a listener for you and it said shut the fuck up and don't make fun of me. I sent that email. This is some of the I'm trying to bring kind of a night energy to the show. I regret I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, what a rude email. Who would ever send? Uh -huh. no, we who, only get... Someone who considers himself a fan yeah. would send you such a rude missive? We get really nice emails exclusively. And then also the, we can turn your podcast into an NFT or whatever. Or like, you need to put your shit on our platform. And say, no, I don't. <laughs> the nicest emails of all. Exactly. We're going to 3D print your podcast and sell it back to you. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm interested. Thank you for the question, Ian. I've got one. Maybe this is a, a an opt out question. So, you know, if it's comfortable to discuss this, do either of you know anybody who's had like a major organ transplant? Yes, that one I do know. Okay. People. And what? My friend had a kidney transplant. Okay. The classic. She writes an email every year on the anniversary of the transplant okay. being like, just wanted to acknowledge like my donor. And That's nice. Hmm. It's a big deal. And and I don't okay. know her personally, but uh, Selena Gomez, obviously. Oh, right. Sure. Of course. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Selena Gomez kidney donorship yeah, yeah. drama. But yeah, she had a big falling out with her friend who gave her the kidney and they just recently reconciled. That's good. We love Whoa, to hear that. That's hot gossip. That's, that's like right in the sweet spot of 
pretty intense and real, but nobody's life well, is on the line. Well, it made people have a I lot of it. like, well, what do you owe the person who gives you their kidney? Wow. You know, yeah. this is like blood work too. Yeah. It was actually, it was really fucked up, it turned out, because it basically seemed like she'd been pressured into it mm. by people, Whoa. you know, mm. being like, you're a match and like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I think it's like when you're giving an organ to a famous person also, it's like they're more important than you. They need it more than you do. Right. But the falling out was really, this is where we get spicy after dark. Yeah, it was really right. allegedly because Selena kept partying after she got the kidney. Oh, the she wasn't kidney. taking care of the kidney. She wasn't taking care of it. So yeah. her friend was like, fuck you. Like, yeah. I gave you this kidney. Pretty reasonable objection, gotta say. Yeah. I didn't almost die, so you could die uh -huh. anyway. <laughs> You know, yeah. but they did just make up and okay. everybody was like, oh, shit. Well, I guess she forgave her for this insane kidney drama. Yeah, we're all we're all growing and changing all the time. We wish them both well. Uh, Ian, what about uh, what about you? What's your what's your organ transplant? I have a well, we have a friend in common friend of the show. Sebastian yeah. has had multiple, if I'm not mistaken, corneal transplants. Oh, boy. Because of a congenital condition so i think that's cool because yeah i don't know if there's as much of a matching thing so you can kind of just, you just slap it on a new pair of sunglasses Hot you swap. know just whoever's <laughs> you know uh -huh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait 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 but is somebody else's eyes like yeah. jerry orbach like the famous uh <laughs> yeah. john mulaney yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah so wait it's just i assume the cornea comes from a dead person's eye that's correct that's but correct. it's just the cornea just the, the rest corny. of the eyes, I don't know what I happens assume. to the rest of the eye. I don't know if they can what take advantage of it. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Seeing a dead person's memories. Yeah, exactly. There's a, I almost thought, I almost watched the eye uh, in preparation for this episode. I thought about it. Honestly, that's a little bit what I thought was going to happen <laughs> yeah. in this movie. Was I was like, oh, is he going to be possessed by the dead woman whose heart mm. he has now? Because that's such a trope in things. Right. But no. Have you seen... I got to figure out what this movie is called. There's a Yes, but not in the way you'd think. <laughs> yeah. How he's possessed. Yeah. There's a I think it's in Oh, it's in the abortive John Carpenter anthology movie Body Bags. That Carpenter was going to do like his own version of Tales from the Crypt on Showtime or something and it didn't go, so they just turned the the three things that were filmed. Oh yeah. Yeah, and Mark Hamill gets He's a baseball player, loses an eye in a car accident, gets a transplant. And the previous, the uh, the eye used to belong to a serial killer. Mm. It's fine. What is notable, it's, it's directed by it's Toby not a Hooper. part of the story. It never comes no, up No, what again. is notable about this in this segment, though, is that Mark Hamill is married to Twiggy. And they Whoa. have, there's a sex scene where he, like, the serial killer's mind takes over while, while they are a bed and you definitely see the back of mark hamill's balls like for sure <laughs> wow really vulnerable it's that or it's a it's a really convincing like modesty patch or whatever but mm. from the so back it's good you're saying you're saying it's good it's yeah. worth checking out <laughs> yeah and saying. then the yeah. um the wraparounds are like uh john carpenter as like a coroner in a morgue mm. doing like crypt keeper stuff but it's john carpenter so it's that's good one of my many neuroses probably stems from the fact that my, as a kid, my sister needed a bone marrow transplant. She's fine. And uh, I, if you can believe it, was not a match. So sort of felt, felt a little useless there. Pretty cool mm. for me. But everything's Do you feel cool like all now. the adults in the room just turned away from you all at once and it never <laughs> yeah, turned, basically turned God back turned his face to look from again? Me. Yeah. No. Uh -huh. Cool. But, uh, you know, I clearly I got over it because now I have a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. All right. That was the two questions. Well, look, if the, if the Selena Gomez story teaches us anything, it's that transplant shouldn't be someone you know and um, um, yeah. are already close with. You want maybe a stranger. There's almost, yeah, there's almost a logic to the kind of anonymity of obtuseness of the... I think the resentment you could grow to have for someone yeah. whose body is made up of part of your body now. Yeah. I guess that's parenting also. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. I mean... Or just family in general, like, like this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like if it's already complicated enough without giving each other bone marrow. Right, right, exactly. And I don't know, would either of you be, would you feel more comfortable with a, like a lab grown organ, do you think? I don't even know. Ian, are they there yet with those? You you seem to. You I keep think up if I'm that. at the point where I need the organ, I'm yeah. taking whatever they sure. they got. You're not picking a choosing. If they're like, it's from a lab or it's from a guy who just died in a car crash. Like, yeah. What about pig heart? You going pig heart? 
Yeah, maybe. Uh-huh. Yeah, Why I would not? love a pig heart. I, I me too. That's my own I'd heart. Love it. I love yeah. pigs. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to give the pig yeah, my heart. Three. Yeah, same. <laughs> That's the ultimate that would be the best. Vegan yeah. gesture. Yeah. Let's start an island of Dr. Moreau. We can do mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Are we not men? <laughs> let's uh, let's get into our movie for the day. We're talking Blood Work, directed by Clint Eastwood. This was released August 9th, 2002. Same day, of course, both of you know this, but the same day as 24 Hour Party People and Triple X with Vin Diesel. So a lot of great options there at the cinema in August 2002. If you want to watch the movie before you listen to the rest of the episode, recommend it. You can check that out in all the usual places if you're here in the United States. Ian for our listeners in Mexico, for your weird little freak friends that you have down there. Not everyone in Mexico, just your friends, I mean. Backing I got off, you. backing off. And you're right. Yeah. What? Uh, <laughs> where can they find it on Mexican internet? Mexican internet has this film available on Google, on Amazon, and Apple TV. Now, Molly, for your benefit, uh, I used to do a joke where I would say that it was called Manzana TV in Mexico because of how they speak Spanish. I don't do that anymore because it's uh, disrespectful, but sometimes uh, an AI-generated voice will say it for me. I can't help it. And then uh, Ian and our guest, guess who it is. So here we go. Man in their TV. He got confused. <laughs> Hmm. Man in their TV. I'll give you a hint. This is this person is uh, sort of in the medical field re- related to our topic today. Man in their TV. And you got any guesses? Boy, do I not. It's got like a real Texan twang to it. Is that an AI artifact or is that a real no, part that's, of this person's that's, voice? No, that's correct. Okay. Do you need it one more time? Is it Dr. Pepper? That's close. <laughs> is it? Similar names. Molly, do you have any, you have any ideas? I'm so confused about what even the setup of the game is. I, I'm, I'm enjoying Great. Okay. not knowing. Yeah, please enjoy. Ian, I'm going to give it to you one more time. Man in their TV. I'll give you a hint. This guy, he's, he's famously been offered to meet someone outside. Ah, uh, to be caught outside. To, yeah, to be, be sort caught of, by sort of somebody outside. outside. Yeah, uh-huh. It's Dr. Phil. It's Dr. Phil. Man in their TV. That doesn't really sound like him. I don't know. This was uh, not one of my stronger efforts. So anyway, yeah, check it out on Manzana TV down there in mm-hmm. Mexico. Mm-hmm. Molly, what is your... Now, we owe you a great debt because I think one of, at least for me, one of the first things that, that got me thinking about this podcast uh, as an idea was your appearance on the Silver Screen Video podcast, where basically you guys did our whole podcast idea in one episode. <laughs> really? <laughs> It out. Hmm. Uh, shouldn't shouldn't really be telling people about that. They can just get the the whole thing, but better. You know what? It's all. It's an extended universe. Just yeah. like we found out, blood work takes place in the same universe as Bosch, Bosch and, uh-huh. the yep. the yeah, right. and the Lincoln Lawyer. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's like that. So I know a little bit of your thoughts on Clint Eastwood, but where do you where are you with Clint Eastwood today? You know. Well, what's funny is I feel like I did a couple podcasts being like Clint Eastwood is a good director, actually. Like he's pretty progressive, actually, because I did another one after that about American Sniper. Nice. Where I was like pro American Sniper. Mm. Because I was like the movie American Sniper is not pro American Snipers. Right. And that's like extremely lost on people when they talk about it. They're like pro war movies like American Sniper. And American Sniper is an anti war movie. There are definitely people who aren't paying attention who are like the yeah. Bradley Cooper character is a hero, but he's like explicitly framed in the movie as like a cuck to begin with <laughs> in like the first 10 minutes, like a loser cuck. And then he like joins the army when he's 30 to like yeah. achieve Valor. But it's like, yeah, his other guys are like making fun of him for lying about stuff. Right. Like he is a loser. And then the second half of the movie is all about how he can't function in society anymore because he's been turned out by the U.S. government. Uh Right, and we're prepared also to argue that the fake baby is an artistic choice, but uh, that's not for today. Yes, totally. The fake baby, like Sienna Miller, she holds that thing. Absolutely. (laughs) But yeah, you know, I think I was sort of like, well, I think he's very misunderstood in a lot of ways because of this sort of second part of his career where he knocked the chair over or whatever, that people were like, oh, he's a big Republican. It was like, no, he's a true libertarian. He hates all forms of authority he hates the cops he hates the government Mm -hmm. you know he's like an interesting and and i was really just got obsessed with like oh he's like a true california libertarian Mm -hmm. it's like his views are all over the place in a way that almost makes no rational sense but it's like yeah he's pro-environment he's probably pro-gun like yeah there was a one of those very watermarked photos uh, on twitter 
there was one of him with an extremely large hunting rifle just the other day. So for sure. Yeah, but also he he got out of army duty himself. He joined the navy and then he was like a lifeguard. Yeah, he was swimming instructor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. California. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, but it's also like he's not. He's from like San Francisco in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. That also is like, oh, okay. He's right. like a he's a West Coast guy. So he's not a jingoistic, right. like he's not the guy that people think of him because they think of his audience as being. Yeah, he's not Dirty Harry himself. Right, he's not Dirty Harry and every movie he made after Dirty Harry is like a response to Dirty Harry yeah. being like actually like vigilante <laughs> justice is bad. Exactly. Like including blood work. Yeah. So you're Yeah, definitely. So you're you're sort of in the same place with him as you were back then. I I just think it's like I I respect that he's turned out so many movies in his career, you know, and that like everything that people said about this one, there's a lot of euphemistic terms where people are like workman like. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, like, as if we don't want our movies to be but, made by workmen. Mm. Well, but it's like he cranks movies out like TV because he came up in TV. So right. he cranks them out like three takes were good. He's not like yeah. an auteur. And that I really respect because it's like his movies are very unpretentious. I've often been watching a movie and been like, who the fuck directed this? And then it was like, oh, it's Clint Eastwood. Like, yeah, it seems improbable to say that an actor director is not self-indulgent, but he's maybe among the least self-indulgent. He's really not directors. self-indulgent. It's yeah. great. I mean, he's self-indulgent in like Bridges of Madison County, like showing his own body and stuff, right. you know? Yeah, but keep indulging. That's why I'm also like, he's not, it's not that he's not a sexist. It's like he, he's an actor. So it's like right. he understands how to objectify himself yes. also. He's mm. like Hollywood sexist exactly yeah yeah he knows how to make himself look the best of anyone in the movie but the movie that made me really be like damn is Clint Eastwood misunderstood underrated is he like a 70s guy really which he is Mm -hmm. was Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil which I just watched at some point that was the one where I went who the fuck directed this and then I was like Clint Eastwood yeah Yeah. and then I was like that's Clint Eastwood must be like really interesting because this movie fucking rocks yeah and you know, and just also I was like, and there's like a portrayal of a trans woman portrayed by the trans woman right. that the character was based on from the book. Yeah. Way before anybody in Hollywood cared about virtue signaling about right. mm-hmm. trans issues yeah. at all. Shout out to the Lady Chablis. Way before it was even like forced as a topic yeah. on people. Yeah. Lady Chablis is so amazing in that movie. So cool. And it's like just so experimental to be like, I'm going to cast the real person to play themselves in this movie where everyone else is a composite. Right. Sort of a proto 1517 to Paris type of thing. Yeah. Or just kind of like no one's going to do a better job than like anyone else would have at that point cast like a cis man and put them in drag Mm -hmm. you know like Mm -hmm. the fact that he was like i'm gonna cast lady chablis to play lady chablis and maybe be like oh okay he had he wants to understand what it's like to be a trans woman in the south like that makes him immediately just like more complicated than i ever thought he was and then i watched a lot of his movies and was like oh yeah even starting to play misty for me it's like Mm -hmm. it's not they're not macho fantasies they're sort of like deconstructions of macho right. fantasies. I think that gets lost on a lot of people. What's interesting is it feels like he's been deconstructing his own image since he had one. Like there's never really been, I mean, with the exception of maybe the first Dirty Harry, there's never really been a an unexamined Clint Eastwood character. Like they're always in the process of being examined, which I find fascinating. Yeah, definitely. And like looking at sort of the commodification of somebody like Clint Eastwood of like, you know, and also it's just to see what somebody who was given sort of every resource on earth and had the confidence mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. keep making things. Because yeah. he has like so many fallow periods too, where people are like, like he just kept making movies as a director to the point that it's just he had so many like comeback eras, like right. Unforgiven, nobody was really checking for him. Yeah. And then this made me be like, oh, this was another like, Nobody was checking for him at the Oscars when he put out Blood Work, and then the next year he made Mystic River, and he exactly like, yeah Return of the King. What's interesting is that he's also this is in the middle of his airport novel adaptation run that includes Absolute Power, yeah, Absolute Midnight Power, Bridges of Madison Good County, mm-hmm. Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. This and Mystic River are all like mass market paperback. Yeah, and I actually like that's another thing I like about him is that he's sort of like a populist. Yeah. But with an eye towards entertaining people and also like Bridges of Madison County is like, like I was saying this on the other podcast, but I was like, he's sort of 
as all over the place genre wise at a certain point as mm-hmm. like somebody like Robert Altman yeah. and sort of the same kind of TV directing style right. of like cast a big ensemble cast, let a bunch of actors do their fucking thing and be good at it yeah. and just put the camera on them and don't move it too much. Yeah, like, exactly. And then had you seen this one before or what was I've your- I've never seen this one. Okay. And quick take. I mean, I was sort of like, at first I was like, this movie's bad. Yeah. And then by the end, I was like, this movie's kind of bad in a enjoyable way, Absolutely. much like airport fiction, yeah. where it's like, yeah, yeah. yes, like I had some stuff to do around the house today. And I was like, this is a great oh, yeah. puttering around the house doing laundry movie, yeah. the kind of movie you would love if it came on television. You'd be like, oh, I'll watch this. Yeah. You know, everyone's trying their best. I think as soon as Jeff Daniels shows up, you're a little bit like he did it because yeah, why is he's he the here? Second most famous person right. in the movie uh-huh. by far. Uh-huh. Yeah, and he's in a funny era too. He's in his last kind of like the last licks of his like shaggy dumb guy yeah. run. I mean, I think he he brings it to me. I will say that as soon as he showed up on screen, obviously it was also a little disappointing as a thriller because you know i think a good thriller makes you feel like you're a step ahead and then it kind of right. flips it on you and you realize you're a step behind and this felt like oh no i've really understood exactly what what the situation has been since right. i mean it's not 20. his fault he's famous if no. it had been anyone else i would have been like maybe right. the weird guys yeah. are red herring yeah but when he fully flips out at the end it was right. like i was laughing really hard yeah it's <laughs> it's it's a weird sort of role for Jeff Daniels in that way because he's so he's become like the liberal ubermensch like he's he's played George Washington and uh, I have a list of all the guys he's played Tom Newsroom George Washington Atticus <laughs> Finch Newsroom. Will McAvoy Tom Newsroom and James Comey oh god I blame Aaron Sorkin for this is, he played Comey in the the Brendan this is Gleason. all Aaron Sorkin's fault yeah of course Aaron Sorkin took this wonderful stoner archetype away from us and right. made him a serious guy no i mean exactly. he also like i forget when squid in the whale is but squid in the whale was when i was like, like oh like seven or something but yeah i think it's after yeah the and after. squid in the whale also like this made me think about that where i was like actually using jeff daniels as a person who's like a sociopath actually is mm-hmm. brilliant yeah. you yeah, know because yeah. he's so charming and doofy and affable right. that when he turns at the end of this movie and is and does the like the crazy yeah. Yeah. I killed your brother. I'm Judge Doom at the end of yeah. Murder of it. <laughs> yeah. Like, he would have been a good Judge Doom. It's scary as hell. Yeah. It's, it's good. It's good acting. It's very, you know, yeah. up to level 10 in a in a good, fun way. And so he's having a big 2002. Of course, he's also in The Hours this year. And then Ooh. we all know the film that he wrote and directed he's this year. He's having a good 2002. <laughs> he's one of the only ones. Uh, <laughs> he's the same year he, he's, uh, he writes and directs and stars in a movie called Super Sucker. Where he is a huh. vacuum cleaner, door to door vacuum cleaner salesman who realizes that his particular vacuum cleaner is also very good at uh, giving women orgasms. And <laughs> it was distributed. It was distributed to 125 screens in the upper Midwest because wow. he's a Yikes. Michigan guy. So he was oh, trying just like the family coming yeah. out. That sounds like the famous Gary Shandling flop movie, What Planet Are You On, where he has a vibrating penis. He's an right. alien with a vibrating yeah, yeah, penis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's just like you hear the joke in the premise and you're like, okay, and then what? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Nope, that's the What's going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He he also, uh, he's, Woody Allen is sort of going to haunt this film a little bit and in, in mm. just uh, in my research because he he runs uh as i mentioned he's from michigan he's from chelsea michigan he still lives there he's become like the benefactor of chelsea michigan and he started the purple rose theater company of course named for in what year excuse me uh he started it i think it was i think it was it's been a bad idea to call it that from the very beginning i I believe okay cool that's that's my question and also of course he's great in that movie yeah he is very very charming in that movie very handsome that was one of the movies where you were like wow woody allen not casting woody allen in a woody allen movie yeah can actually make a film yeah yeah but anyway the uh take you out the board it's like a non-profit the theater company and the board of course includes the chief sustainability officer of the dow chemical company so uh Hmm. yeah he's uh as i mentioned lib uh ubermensch but let's just uh, well, let's lay out the speaking of premises. Let's lay out the premise of the film very quickly because it's a, I think it's a great one. I think it's like a it's a good hook. Is it? 
Yes, well, thank you, Molly. Sometimes uh-oh. we need a little reality check. Oh, no. <laughs> Here, here's, here's what I felt about this movie. Yeah, please. Was I was like, I can feel that it's a book. Oh, and I book, can yeah. feel that things that wouldn't bother me in a book are going to drive me crazy in a movie because they seem so unnatural. Well, have you read any of the Bosch books? Are you a Michael Connolly person at all? No, but I probably should. My friend Max Silvestri is like a Michael Connolly super fan, right. Bosch super fan. And I think he just saw my story about how I was watching this movie and sent me a video I can't watch yet where he's probably <laughs> correcting me on what I'm wrong about, about okay. blood work and Michael Connolly and the Bosch extended universe. Right. Because I do, I love Pulp Fiction. I love yeah. mystery writers. I don't know. As soon as they were like, he's got to find the the heart i don't know it was a little within the i think within the the playbook of the airport novel the kind of the bonehead logic of those books i think this is a really great oh shit i know exactly what how this movie is gonna go and i want to see it yeah what i'll say for it is it definitely drew me in when i first started it i was like i don't know about this it's not ripping me by the collar well, I think the character of Arango is pretty tough also yeah. uh, in well, terms of Well, that's also a Paul Rodriguez problem. We'll get into it. Very is quickly. Is Paul Rodriguez? It I is. actually yeah. thought he was great in this movie oh, and enjoyed wow. every time he was on We're the screen. We're fighting on this episode. I, mean, I like this. Yeah. He's trying, you know? I I don't yeah. know. Well, that I, I that's my problem. He's yeah. really trying. <laughs> He's So we're talking about it. This is adapted from the, the Michael Connolly novel from 1998, seven, which is about a guy named Terry McCaleb, former FBI man. In the book, he has like some kind of congenital like heart infection or something. In the movie, he is an old guy who has a heart attack while chasing down the serial killer who defines his career, gets a heart transplant, and he's recovering. Uh, on, well, he's retired. He lives on his boat. Woman comes up to him and says... I need you to find whoever killed my sister. He says, I don't do that. And she says, her heart is beating in your chest right now. That's what I mean. I think that's why I was like, couldn't it just be someone else? Yeah. That he has to find or like someone else who has a heart transplant or something. The thing of like, you're literally looking for the person who killed the person. Yeah. With this heart that's you're now beating in your chest. I was like, that's a little stupid. But it's also because the movie is sort of presented naturalistically. So yeah. when there were things that were like a little silly, I was like, if this were a little campier, if this were right. like a little more like Cape Fear or something, mm-hmm. it would be fine. That's but like, because yeah. it's Clint Eastwood and it's kind of like just a workaday movie, you're a little bit like, this is crazy. <laughs> People are crazy. <laughs> Ian, did you, do you like this movie? I did like this movie. I enjoyed okay. watching this film. There are several elements to it that i think not just in the like nitpicky what do they call those guys like Plot hole. honest trailers type yeah, yeah. people you know these awful um smart aleck type approach there's just some things to it that just don't work and i think they're they're too prominent to totally ignore you know like the the kid later basically gets kidnapped and everybody's like it's fine the kid's fine we don't have to worry about him that's not <laughs> right. something we're worried about in this film and that's okay well I mean, I think there is something interesting going on with Clint Eastwood, the man, you know, the the macho sort of archetype, having a the heart of a woman of color in his chest. And like the movie doesn't go into it, but there is something they go into it at the end of the movie when he says, if I ever see you around this dock again, this Mexican's going to kick your ass. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Jeff Daniels is worst lines in the film when he's saying, are you like, do you need to go get an enchilada for your part?" Also, I was like, this is what white racism is like. Like this movie's a little bit, if you're going to touch the wire, like touch it, you know, talk about exactly. And white beach people who are racist. (laughs) Huntington beach. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. Orange County, like, yeah, Uh like a laid back beach bro is like violently racist. Like shock me. Yeah. Surf surf Nazis must die. We should say. Yeah. I mean, I kind of was like, and it's written by Brian Helgeland who then also wrote Mystic River and he's written some movies that I do really like Like LA Confidential. So yeah, he wrote LA Confidential, which LA Confidential kind of deals with LA Confidential is based on a way crazier book that feels much less adaptable than like a Michael Connelly book. Yeah, yeah. And does a decent job with sort of like the complex racial politics of Los Angeles. Right. Yeah. This movie's a little bit I don't know. It like 
tries to get a little bit into it and then it's like "Mm -mm, no we're not yeah it's it doesn't really have time for any of that no it's like he's horny for the sister right He's also horny for his doctor. like former not she well the he's horny for the doctor but I think he's also horny for the the sheriff lieutenant or what I don't know what her rank is I think is. they uh, have yeah they he's have horny for everybody real chemistry in this movie. I was into their relationship I will yeah. say as soon as they yeah, me they too. started hanging out I thought why did we wait fifty minutes for this to come well, along well that's like another this was something else about Clint Eastwood movies that I was like it's not that he's a full on feminist obviously he's yeah. really horrible to Sandra Locke you know mm-hmm. like his his real life politics do not necessarily match what he puts on screen yep. but all of his movies are about a hot guy who's underestimated because he's so hot or good at his job having uh-huh. to like convince a smart woman to give him a chance yeah basically <laughs> which is very 70s of him particularly yeah you know, in this like, stretch you're right this is this is the big thing all of it there was one i saw recently i saw tightrope i think Tightrope's and great in in our opinion it was the same thing where it's yeah. just like i know everybody thinks i'm just like a big hot slab of meat because i am right but i'm also <laughs> like a heart and yeah. brain and yeah and then, and then, like a career gal who's got to let her guard down. So it's like those movies are marketed to me, you know. Like I <laughs> yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this one I remember being. This was early in my Clint sort of exploration. I remember being very impressed by this movie because I just thought he was the the chair guy, and to see him flirting with the black sheriff, whatever rank she is, and and making himself this kind of semi-feminized semi-otherized guy with a mexican woman's heart in his chest like i i thought was for him or for a guy like that like an interesting move whether the movie sort of earns that is up for debate i'm gonna say no i'm gonna (laughs) debate you and and (laughs) debate no yeah i mean it seems yeah but it's like he's trying something he is trying i think so in your Say something about Arango and the let's let's talk about some of the other sort of uh, characters. Yeah, this I mean, this is the problem every time we talk about Clint Eastwood racial politics, particularly when he's doing a lighter film and he will mix jokes that seem to be satirizing the type of people who make those jokes and also kind of just make the jokes at the same right. time. He, he wants seemingly wants to get away with both aspects of it. We talked about with this with absolute power. And the Chinese waiter, you know, these oh, types God. of things where you're just like, what? Oh, God. Yeah. The Chinese waiter at like an Italian restaurant. Like there shouldn't be a Chinese. <laughs> He's like, this killed in 1953 <laughs> exactly. at the store club. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I'm sure it did. Yeah. yeah. Arango, I, I mean, on the one hand, great to have, you know, uh, well, great in some ways, but lots of the LAPD is Latino and right. you know, whether they're reinforcing white supremacy, as we've talked about on other episodes or a genuine step forward. That's kind of a bigger question, but right. I understand why you would it's have this character. In there. It's yeah, the first yeah, one. yeah, it is. It is the first one. But here he just seems to be there so that Clint can, first of all, an, an ongoing thing we've recognized is that Clint does not have male friendships or male friendships go bad in most of his films in some right. way. You're only really allowed to have vulnerable relationships with women, which I think or, he has three in this film. Orangutan. Or orangutans. Yeah. Yes. An orangutan. Correct. I yeah. think it's also he's had that's the thing about him deconstructing the image too, is it's like more than a lot of people, he had the experience that like a lot of women have in Hollywood of being treated like an object yeah. because mm-hmm. He was so hot. He played a lot of cowboys and then yeah. he's in all the Sergio Leone movies. He has no dialogue. Right. He's just a hottie His image yeah and so i think he's also you know maybe just being being an, an actor is like a feminized occupation because yeah. you're admitting you like people to look at you and you like to prance around i always think about that with the tough guy actors like uh i don't know like robert loja or something one of these guys who you you're always afraid of on screen but then when you think about it like he is practicing his lines you know there's something very silly and completely untough about any of those guys or like uh who's the big uh, robert zadar is that the guy with the big face right it's like they're all doing shakespeare yeah. and stuff you're doing they're the not... school play even yeah if that's you, what yeah. somebody yeah. told me was is that if you think about the fact that every person you're watching pretty much is a theater kid then it's, mm-hmm. it's very different yeah. to watch terry cruz or something and i don't mean that in a, a derogatory way it just yeah. presents a different picture no, i mean i think there's also people that were like 
genuine heavies who get into acting. Yes. Right. You know, I think that's like the exception. Yeah, like, like a, a, like uh, a Trejo, Trejo. Yeah, Trejo or, the obvious. or even like yeah. a Connery yeah. era. And the Godfather too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of guys on The Sopranos from like real hoods. That yeah. They, yeah. I think you know yeah. had a second act of acting. Exactly. Uh, so I want to talk about Paul Rodriguez really quick, who plays uh, uh, Detective Arango. He's he was born in Culiacan. He's raised in Compton, and he is a classic. Latino Republican. He owns part mm. of the Laugh Factory. He is active in California water advocacy because he owns some agricultural interests in the Central Valley <laughs> with then Governor Schwarzenegger. He founded something called the California Latino Water Coalition, which is just like a very greenwashed lobbying group where like the city of Sacramento paid for buses to take everybody to the rally, like that kind of He's shot a couple of Spanish language TV ads for the Mitt Romney campaign, says, Mm. you know, uh, he agrees with a lot of what Trump has done, that kind of thing. So I I do think he brings a kind of... Hey, guys, he denounced Michael Richards' N-word rant. Hey. Very brave. (laughs) Hugely (laughs) radical. It happened at that laugh factory. Yeah. 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 Well, honestly, I was like, I I don't know what it's It's going to do. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, and his son is a professional skateboarder. Well, that's right. Uh, cool. Spending the X Games. Yeah. But I think he's like, he's projecting a kind of completely unearned bravado in this that I recognize as like a cop personality type. Like he really embodies Oh, this is an that. interesting reading. If you're trying to tell me that he's annoying in the same way that real cops are, they're like, think they're way more interesting Honestly, than that's kind of how I took it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or yeah, right. just like, I thought... I think having a comedian play a cop is also like their yeah. comedians are scary. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you yeah. let them tap into the scary thing of yeah. like, yeah, uh-huh. this person needs a lot of attention yeah. and that can be fun or scary depending on Makes the context. Makes them like borderline sociopathic in terms of how they treat victims' bodies and stuff. Yeah. Right. I've never had a cop like make a joke when they're like letting you off for a ticket oh, yeah. or something yeah. and you're like, uh, 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 yeah. uh, like <laughs> we are laughing. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Scary. Nothing worse than the short cop, too. That maybe the most mm. dangerous people yeah. in the world. Any cop below five. I thought six. he was good at playing a menacing LBC yeah. or LAPD cop. Yeah, and he like it definitely was like, I don't like him. No. And he wants he's like mad at McCaleb for getting all the attention because he was tracking down the, the code killer. And so there's a, that too. That's I would have cut yeah. would have cut the code killer aspect. That also, I was just like, does every killer have to have a Zodiac type plan? Like, can't some people just be like not doing well? I agree with you, Molly. Although I think it's not coincidental how much cops like to obsess over these because I do think it's these types of cases are what allow them to be the most insane about thin blue right. line stuff. Well, same right? with the Dirty more Harry. insane yeah. the killer, the more you can beat up victims yeah. or or like you know shoot. Asian American women in a car because they might be a cop killer. Yeah, well, a killer cop in that case. Yes, it, well, you're a killer right. cop killer. I've read some of the Bosch books. I enjoy them, but like in the right way, and everyone knows that I'm <laughs> enjoying them properly. Um, uh-huh. That's what I mean. I think it's also like you can you can consume things. Yeah, where cops are the heroes, and yeah. it doesn't mean you think cops are the heroes. And yeah, I mean, I, I think so. So Connolly writes like five Bosch books or something. Interestingly, he gets really big because Bill Clinton, then President Bill Clinton, is photographed walking out of a bookstore with a Bosch book in his hand. Hmm. Honestly, that's who I thought that Doctor Phil clip was. That might be Bill Clinton. It's pretty close. Oh, Clinton. Well, Clinton, we've done a, a ways back. But then he decides, he writes a book from the perspective of a journalist, because Connolly himself was a like, crime reporter for the LA Times. And then he decides he's going to make another character. So Harry Bosch, who I think is named after Dirty Harry, he is, of course... Uh, he's named after Hieronymus Bosch. Well, yeah, but obviously. he's called Harry. Also true. But I think the Harry, you know... Yeah, but they specify many times that his full name is Hieronymus, Hieronymus Bosch. Of course. Mm. And, if, and Michael Connolly's publishing house is like Hieronymus Bosch publications or whatever. And I would love to imagine that Bosch books and TV series are a, a type of hellscape that we've been dragged into they where every player are. is a, a demon that's yeah, there's torturing like a, a humanity. Guy with a, a pig butt uh, who's like wearing a nun's <laughs> habit. He, so he decides to make a new character. Now, Harry Bosch is like, he got famous because he was specifically like targeted by a serial killer. And then that case kind of ruined his career. 
So then Connolly decides to make a new character who is like a media famous <laughs> uh, detective, but this time he's in the FBI and the serial killer ruined his career. So, and then they cross over, of course, in uh, 2001's A Darkness More Than Night. Yeah, really, really good. That sounds good. Learned about that title from the Hollywood Handbook podcast, where I believe they yeah. have a hat that says that. It's incredible. It makes no sense. Just a trash thing it's to a say. a great title for anything. That's yeah. how I got into to Bosch. And then, obviously, the Lincoln lawyer is Bosch's half-brother. We all know this. We know this. This is the first Connolly adaptation, too. You know what? That's crazy, because yeah. like, a lot of those guys, too, who write like a hunt... Like, I was reading a lot of Elmore Leonard recently, yeah. and you're just like, yeah, they made some movies of this, but you could make a hundred yes. movies. Yes. Yep. From, yep. This person's written a hundred thousand books, yeah. and they're all, they uh-huh. all make good movies. Like, it's crazy there aren't more. Have, so, Ian, you're a big TV guy. Have you? Did you ever watch Castle? I did watch Castle. I watched the first few seasons in I don't college. Think I... It was one of my depression shows. Go on. <laughs> Wait, which, which shows weren't your depression shows? That's a better question. Castle sounds like a depression show. He is a... Uh, Castle's <laughs> yeah. like a, one of these... He's like a Michael Connolly. And Michael Connolly he appears is like a Michael Con- in the show correct. He's as his, himself. one of his poker buddies. Yeah, he's like playing poker with Michael Connolly and like, what is it, Dean oh, Koontz? Oh, because they're all... They're all genre ex- like, writers and they exactly. all, who yeah. are hang out. either now cops or like ex investigators or whatever. They're and all what's weird is crime. Nathan Fillion from Castle uh-huh. was on a, I think might still be on a show called The Rookie. No relation to the Clint Eastwood film The Rookie, but mm. The Rookie apparently features heavily a liquor store which is the same liquor store from this movie. (laughs) Because I went to look it up. (laughs) I went to look it up. It's in Burbank. It's pretty close to, it's like not far from the former Racer's Edge, now K1 Racing go-kart place where you and I went to a birthday party once again. Um, But all over Google Maps, it's like people saying, I love the rookie and like taking pictures of themselves, like pointing to the the liquor store from the God, who the rookie. loves the rookie so yeah. much they're going to that. It's the I same mean, people who post on Google Maps is that's who loves the rookie. My friend lives near, I believe it's called Bob's Liquor, which is from Fast and the Furious oh, movies. Sure. Yeah. Bob's Food Store or something. Yeah, that's I live kind of close. Yeah. And people were going there so much and doing donuts every night <laughs> that they put in like a huge crazy yeah, yeah, yeah. thing to block people from doing donuts. Whoa. And I was personally mad about it felt like yeah. they should take it down yeah that's when we go clint eastwood libertarian mode and say you gotta let yeah. these people be free let them be free to destroy their tires and fire rubber particulates <laughs> into the let air let them race yeah yeah that's right let, let them live them their drag. lives a quarter mile at a time that's what uh gran torino is about so right this woman named graciela torres played by is it wanda de jesus i assume so uh-huh yeah. By the way, she's been married to Jimmy Smith since 1986. Nice work if you can get it. I think it. that rocks. Yeah. yeah. Good for her. Good for her. She's mostly yeah. a, a soap actress, but she's also just done a ton of television. She and RoboCop 2. She is. Uh, she comes to him with a picture of her deceased sister, Glory Torres, and says her heart is in your chest. Can you help me find her killer? And of course, his doctor, Dr. Angelica Houston, she's playing Dr. Bonnie Fox, she doesn't want Clint to do this because he needs to rest. He's like six weeks post-operation. She shoves uh, various objects through like a... Is it a stent? Is that what that's called, Ian? It is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And that's very viscerally gross to me. That's like hard for me to, to watch. Mm-hmm. And she's saying like, you're going to kill yourself. You got to... You got to... Selena Gomez style. You have to accept this gift that you've been given. Angelica Houston, of course, the daughter of John Houston, who Clint portrayed in White Hunter Black Heart. She was born while her father was in Uganda filming The African Queen. Supposedly, news of her birth had to be carried to him by a runner Mm. because he was so deep into the jungle. I believe she says blood work five times in the film. uh, (laughs) Yeah, she says blood work so many times. There was also like five minutes of this movie where I was like, oh, is this going to be like a romance? Pretty heavy on that. Not unreasonable. You I mean, would think that. Uh-huh. Angelica Houston and Clint Eastwood, like I would love that actually. And then no, she goes away. Yeah. He can't help but have chemistry with whoever is on screen. In a lot of his movies, it is like every woman he meets is like, oh my God, like I'm going to throw my life away to be with yeah. you. But in the books that I've read, that seems like it is a true effect that he has on <laughs> both men and women everywhere he goes. But I don't know. Yeah, I mean, he's really he's tall and hot. Yeah. And yep. he's been famous yep. since like 1955. So. Yeah. Yeah. And he talks You know what? Quietly. He did hit on a friend of mine. Oh, yeah? He hit on a friend of mine like 
10 years ago. Where? And she said that it, she was working on a shoot of something okay. that he was doing mm-hmm. and she was just like setting up a light or something and he yeah. just was like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> All of this right tracks. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, you know, you wouldn't think you'd be into it, but you, yeah. he's he's got he's got Riz. He's got that something. He invented Riz. Riz Eastwood, yeah. <laughs> I think it's also I don't want to ascribe. It's hard with you know Eastwood famously doesn't seem to he's not exacting as a filmmaker, so I don't want to draw too much. I don't want to ascribe too much like artistic intent to these things. But he's married to Dina at this time. This is like smack in the middle of his marriage to Dina Eastwood, who was a TV reporter. She appears in the film very briefly as one of the TV reporters who like shoves a camera in his face. The woman who plays Glory Torres in the very upsetting, silent, black and white security camera footage of the murder, uh, and I guess some some disposable camera photos, is a, a woman named Maria Quibon, okay. who you can see, I think, right now or like tomorrow morning on Good Day LA because she is a TV reporter. She's, she does the weather on Good Day hmm. LA right now. At the okay. time, she was a TV reporter in Orange County. I think it's it's there's something there maybe that he picked a woman who from a hundred yards looks pretty similar to his then wife has the same job to be the person whose heart is like put into his body. I mean, he could have the character you could you could just get a model. You could pretty get romantic. Anybody. I'm yeah, being won over. You are okay. Good. I'm so glad. Yeah. The movie's great. It should have won best picture. Well, what you haven't mentioned yet is that. The main character, of course, is an FBI profiler. Yeah. So I would love to talk about FBI. It was just profilers in general. Yeah, give me Crime some profiler profiling. stuff. So first of all, I will say that maybe people are aware it's become increasingly popular for police departments, sheriff departments, the the FBI, whatever. Basically, every person in law enforcement to be more interested in profiling. It's by several orders of magnitude. It's employed more and more. It is, of course, one of these classic fake sciences which is not real <laughs> it's like like when you become like hugh dancy and you like go into the mind of the killer kind of thing and yes then, it's okay. it, it is exactly that i will say that unfortunately in whatever types of controlled studies you can do professional profilers regularly do worse than average people who know nothing about the crimes involved so <laughs> their guesses are are just statistically worse that's uh, so and of funny. course Unfortunately, even worse than the experts are the police who are not experts in criminal profiling, but claim to be. And they do extremely badly. They did like 35% or something on these uh, assessments. That's really funny. And I would like to offer to you guys the chance to guess what we think the roots of criminal profiling are as a science. This is probably started in the 19th century, maybe a guy named Cesare Lombroso. Do you have any guesses about what what other stuff he was interested in? I have an idea, Molly. Do you want to do you want to go? Is it eugenics? It sure I was. was. Going to say phrenology. Oh, okay. It's both of those things. <laughs> hey, hey, you guys every, both get points. He was a everybody wins. Phrenologist uh, who wow. went into Italian prisons and identified some of the most famous head shapes that would uh, indicate <laughs> that you're, of course, an Italian criminal born mm. from the lower. Italianoid class. head shape. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the lasagnoid. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. They, we we have the fusilli guys. We got the, yeah, exactly. Whatever, priest chokers. Well, no, this guy, this guy couldn't have. He's a got a Capolini type, so he couldn't have used marinara sauce in the <laughs> crime. It's right. not the right one. So it's just a great field. Uh, it's also just one of the spots where you can see the Barnum effect in play. This is what attracts people to like personality tests and anything where you feel like anything you read that somebody says is about you, you're inclined to say, oh yeah, that does sound like me. Yeah. Seemingly just this natural psychological confirmation that you want to find and whatever yeah. you're reading about either yourself or somebody else. So cool that this is the other person that they came up with, the non-cop, yeah. because now we have phrenologist cop. And I will also say it's a point <laughs> of interest. The fictional origins of criminal profiling are probably in the Murders in the Rue Morgue, the Edgar Allan Poe story. The first detective story. Yeah. They say. Do you know, either of you guys, who the who is discovered to be the criminal? The, the criminal profile fails miserably in that story, so more accurate. Is, than, it, like a, is it like a Jew? Oh, is great it, yeah. guess. Is it great the guess. maid or something? Is it like the help? Uh, it is an Urang Atan. <gasps> Which committed the crime. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. oh, I love this. Yeah. That's so good. I was going off going off the eugenics uh-huh. stuff. 
Right. I've been trying to go off eugenics for years. I should say, while we're talking about profilers, uh, mm -hmm. Molly Lambert Innocent, because you've written a number of wonderful profiles in your time. Billie Eilish, Shalana Heim, some of these great <laughs> profiles. Sure. Yes, whatever. this is the kind of profile we like. I am basically an FBI. I'm an FBI profiler. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, there is no regulatory body, so you actually can say that you're an expert profiler and nobody can stop <laughs> well, you. Well, here's the secret to profiling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is you spend an hour with somebody you're never going to see again. Right. Mm -hmm. And you spend the first 45 minutes making them comfortable, and then you spend the last 15 minutes asking real questions. Okay. Oh, yeah. I bet that would also work in a criminal situation. I assume so. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, they like pretend to eat a cheeseburger. <laughs> yeah. That was like the big, the profile thing. Like a fam I'm famous on this show for having a subscription to Esquire magazine when I was 12. And that was like always the... Oh, when they're like Scarlett Johansson yep. chomps into yep. her yeah, cheeseburger. She's shoveling her... this normal people food into her face like she claims uh -huh. to do every day. Yeah. That's a distraction tactic. So you don't know that they're murderers. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I was thinking about this in the context of because this is like, you know, as so many of Clint's films are a response to Dirty Harry or a commentary on Dirty Harry. This is to date the last film in which Clint plays any kind of detective or investigator. And I was thinking about it because he physically for the first half of the movie anyway, can't cop. He can't chase people he can't he doesn't carry the gun well he does get to shoot a, a fleeing suspect in the back he does that later but there, special. there's a moment where he's he's trying to be like an investigator without the cop part yes and i was thinking like is that better and i decided no well, obviously but like here's what i'm gonna say mm -hmm. i think i don't know if private investigator is a cab you know, mm, yeah. I think a lot of private investigators, especially just in the history of the genre, are people who get so disenchanted with the cops that they go rogue. Right, like a like a shaft. It's true. Although you also have the Pinkertons, some of the most right. famous PIs, and these are the the actual literal agents of capital. Yeah, yeah, and some of them are truly just like like money. I need money. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. do whatever pays money, which to me is not the same as like I'm serving the state. It's like oh yeah. I'll I'll catch this person. Yeah. I like all the like your your Jake Giddies in Chinatown yeah. where it's like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I'll do this kind of like dirt bag work of catching people right. fucking somebody that's yeah. not their husband, you know? Yeah. And then accidentally stumble upon the larger corruption. It does seem possible that it would make it less likely for you to kill an innocent person if you're a PI because yeah. there's just probably not that much in it for you. Probably so many. If you're a PI now, it's probably all on a computer. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was just thinking of, of course, uh, Brian Wolf from Nathan Freeman. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. From Nathan Freeman. You. you know, he has a. He you had know a what? There's also <laughs> like, I feel like there's people who come to Los Angeles because they want to be a PI because they've seen so many movies right. where that yeah. is a thing. Yeah. So I do think there's a type of like stifled actor like Brian Wolf who's like, <laughs> yeah. I will become the protagonist of like Spade and Archer. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, you yeah. know, he had a uh, he had a reality show called Cry Whoa. Wolf that was like him being Doc the Bounty Hunter. Right, but it's like, how could that possibly be good for you as a detective <laughs> to be on television? Right, exactly. You know? Yeah, great, well, it's like the question. it's like the Sasha Baron Cohen thing. It's like Doctor Drew. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Yes, like yes. if you're if you're a doctor you're not on tv if you're, if you're a good like a doctor legitimate yeah, yeah. Doctor. yeah well the good doctor is on tv Ian. <sighs> damn he's well, right right well he's autistic yeah he's right. that's what makes he's, him such a good doctor he true. is a surgeon or whatever yeah maybe the code killer was on the spectrum and we are mm. being biased it's against so hard because like i want to make fun of elon musk and jeff bezos for literally anything they do but then it turns out some sometimes it's like ableist but then maybe are they no you can make fun of them it's not ableist to make fun of elon musk and jeff bezos okay thank god yeah, you can make fun of Elon Musk for being a white South African. I will. I solemnly know. swear, Molly, that I will do this. Call me a phrenologist, but <laughs> yeah. white South Africans, yeah. I don't fucking trust them. Yeah, I don't trust with those guys. Jeff Bezos also has a Swedish last name, and then he took his stepfather's last name, which is Cuban. Oh, interesting. Mm. To, like, but doesn't he look like evil. a weird like Swedish guy? It makes a lot more sense. Well, now he looks... He's, I think, trying to get enough filler to become a perfect sphere head like he's just gonna <laughs> turn into a sort of a, an avatar a, a mannequin i think you're allowed to be luxist against like loser <laughs> nerds who are filling their yeah. face with plastic to try and achieve a beauty standard yeah like, they'll never reach isn't it crazy also how like just like seeing how old clint eastwood looks is like so refreshing now yeah. yes yeah 
It's crazy. It's like, damn, a leading man who just looks like an old guy. Uh-huh. And you're like, damn, I bet that old guy can throw pipes still. Yeah, exactly. You know? One man plumbing company. Yeah. I mean, we might have to cut this out, though, because we are trying to get Elon on for the Invictus episode. We're in talk. <laughs> <laughs> Elon's a big Jersey Boys fan. <laughs> Surprising, surprising, yeah. I'm a big Jersey Boys fan. Oh, TBH. The, the Jersey Boys, the Jersey Boys Army is. Oh, you gotta watch it. It's crazy. I'm excited. The thing that makes it crazy is that it's like an Altman movie. He just used the Broadway cast and shot them all singing live, yeah. which nobody ever does for musicals. Yeah, really so weird. it's like a weird kind of naturalistic, and it's it's truly just Goodfellas the musical. Hmm. And sounds good. Again, kind of like slightly more progressive gay politics than you would expect. Joe Pesci introduced some of the four seasons. Like he he was like a an Well, that's what I mean. It's like the world of I love stuff that's about the music business in that era when it was like so unbelievably crooked and pay for play yeah. and like people putting people in these insane contracts because that's what podcasting is like now. Mm, uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Where it's like you're going to pay to rent a studio for your own record somehow. Mm-hmm. Uh but yeah, just like the music business stuff is so tied in with the mob. Right that's also scary like the way that comedians can be deployed to be scary like frankie valley is the scariest motherfucker on earth <laughs> and he's you know yeah and he with the guy like with a the short high guy voice with a falsetto yeah. and then you know he's had people whacked yeah like, that's so scary i mean that's way scarier than a guy who just like seems scary it's like a guy who's like hey i'm a little guy and i like to sing hi and then he kills you yeah. know? speaking of scary I, I didn't realize that today is a very auspicious day for us to be talking about a movie that takes place in Long Beach with the Queen Mary in the background of several shots. I, I speak, of course, today is the opening day of Shacktoberfest. Oh, <laughs> wow. The, uh, the haunted Queen Mary parking lot or something that the the long beach haunted harbor event that somehow decided, you know what we should do to get more people here is uh, well, Shack. I love that because it is like the Queen Mary is truly sinking. Yeah, it's falling apart. Into that harbor. It, it's falling apart. Yeah. Like a lot of things in California, it's like it would need a lot of money to yes. be maintained. It's the ultimate boat in and that so sense. So instead, <laughs> they're just letting it rot and people keep buying it to try and make money off of it. But it seems haunted in that. It seems like you can't monetize it, but also like how would you monetize it? It's haunted in the, the realist way of they all. They had to cut off the lifeboats the because they were pulling the side of the ship off. So they had to like cut <laughs> free the lifeboats. It's gotten so bad that the city took back control of the boat. They had contracted out like maintenance of it to some real estate company that went bankrupt. I feel like that that whole Long Beach port area that they're always trying to turn into like a fun zone and it's just something about it repels yeah. tourism. They thought about building the second Disneyland park there. They were thinking hmm. about for some reason. Yeah, I mean, that would make sense. Having, a, yeah. having one in Anaheim and one in Long Beach though. And like the Queen Mary was going to be part of it somehow. Right. Just like weird historical artifacts. And apparently a, a bunch of uh, Scottish parliamentarians were like complaining to the city of Long Beach because the Queen Mary was built in Scotland. And so they're like, you're not taking care of our heritage. Take it back. Causing it an international incident. Yeah, please take it back. We don't want it. We uh-huh. don't want this rotting <laughs> Scottish hole. It's like, yeah, this apparently uh, haggis. filled with sewage because somebody tried to fix a pipe with duct tape and like the, the ballroom flooded with sewage sick that's yeah. the ocean telling you to go back like <laughs> yeah that's your being expelled from the ship do you have long beach feelings molly or like san pedro feelings do you have Ooh, is there anything what a beautiful about album yeah sure yeah long beach feelings yeah i like long beach i'm from the valley it's kind of like the valley yeah in many ways it does have it's like big mm, good observation yeah sort of uh, big long streets, big wide yeah. streets, and mm-hmm. like a lot of parking. Kids skateboarding, kind of yeah. confused, mixed residential and commercial a lot of the time. Yeah, it's yeah, a, exactly. It's interesting how this movie skips over the Los Angeles basin. Like it's it's Long Beach and it's the Valley. Yes, yeah, Long Beach and the Valley. Well, that made sense to me too. It's kind of like on the margins. And right. I feel like a lot of these crime novels are kind of in the little. Yeah. That's where the stuff happens. Well, and especially when you get to your like seventh novel based in los angeles you're starting to look for the more interesting places well that's also like i read uh rum punch which is the novel that turned into jackie brown Mm -hmm. the elmore leonard novel and it's all set in florida 
but it like perfectly yeah. transports over to South LA. Yeah. Feels like, you know, the perfect South LA movie. What's, what's weird. I feel like it's coincidental sometimes like that. Michael Connelly's from Florida. And after this movie comes out, maybe with some of the money from it, he moves back to Tampa. And ever since, for the last 20 years, he's been writing Los Angeles-based novels LA from novels. Tampa. That's interesting. Mm, yeah. That's funny. Elmore Leonard should move to LA. I, I don't know. I mean, I I love people who do stuff like that. I think there's a kinship between Florida and California yeah. also in the type oh, of, of sort of yeah. like, you know, stereotypes of everybody's hot and stupid. And, <laughs> yeah. That's what makes know, Get Shorty so good. Morally depraved. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, then you can go to the beach. Exactly. I have a, oh, I do have a question. This is just an observation my girlfriend made. I wanted to see if you both agreed with this. In the scene where Clint first goes to the police station to meet with Arango and the guy from Nip Talk, where he brings Krispy Kreme donuts with him. Yep. Do those Krispy Kreme donuts look smaller to you than they are <laughs> now? Do. Or does everybody have big hands? Because when Clint picks one up, really? it looks small. And I thought, well, his hand is probably big. But then like Paul Rodriguez picks really one up. I really didn't notice. I don't know. Give it another. They must both have big hands. Let's take a two hour break. We'll come back. We'll go watch uh-huh. the whole movie. <laughs> I, I love I'm gonna this. I'm going to go get a Krispy Kreme. Thing. Krispy Kremes are slightly smaller than how you imagine They're a donut. They're a little smaller. Yeah. It is true. Well, I, there, there's also, speaking of donuts, this movie kind of uninterrogatedly gets into the racialized liquor store culture of Los Angeles where we have sure. Mr. Kang. I believe so. Yeah. Who is the, the proprietor of the liquor store where Glory Torres is shot and then his wife takes over. The wife, by the way, played by... The same actress who played Mrs. Choi in the movie Lady in the Water, who, of course, is the one who reveals that Bryce Dallas Howard's character is, in fact, a narf, the mystical creature from the blue world. And by the way, she's not just a narf. <laughs> she might be the fabled once in a millennium Madam Narf. Wow. Uh, the famous <laughs> Korean word of movie. narf. Uh-huh. I, feel like, I feel like there were a lot of movies that... Because this is 2002. This is literally 10 years later. Exactly. After the Rodney King, right? So <laughs> people are still thinking about that stuff, but it's also like it feels out of date at this point because now everything's 9-11 when the time this movie comes yeah. out. Yeah. It's like, that was the last thing we were concerned about. Mm-hmm. Now we're concerned we're about- We're all united again. Now we're in, racist in this other way. Yeah, yeah a different race guys. that we've yeah. uh, made our enemy. I looked so, you know, Clint works so fast that this movie was shot. The entire production happens between- 9-11 and August 2002. So like it is all a post 9-11 movie. I don't think there's anything particularly 9-11 to it. No, not whatsoever. I would yeah. have guessed it was from like 1998. Yes. But it feels yeah. like a holdover from 1998 that came out. It also said he hated making it. Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder if, because like, you know, collateral damage was in the can for eight months while they waited for America to be ready for a movie about terrorism again. And like, there was a Jackie Chan movie where he apparently, I think, like blew up the World Trade Center or something that they had to stop the production of. God, I was thinking about this the other day because I saw Bottoms, which mm. I really liked. Mm. I thought it was really funny. Um, and there's terrorism jokes in Bottoms. And I was like, oh, my God, yeah. are we allowed to do terrorism jokes well, again? It's like been long enough. They're letting people do jokes about. Rudy said that SNL could be funny again, if you'll recall. <laughs> Right. John Stewart told us on The Daily Show that we were allowed to laugh. <laughs> yeah. And- we gotta. Uh, but I wonder if this was like an easy green light because it had nothing to do with 9 11. I don't And it is a kind of. Res- it seemed like it was truly a studio holdover yeah. from whatever contract he had that he was getting ready to make Mystic River, but he still yeah. had said he would do this because he bought the rights and right. said he would do it. So they were like, do that first. This and true crime were like, which am I going to do first? I think sort of decisions. That's funny he said he hated the script because Brian Helgeland also did the yeah. script for Mystic River. Helgeland is like a... I get the sense of Brian Helgeland is kind of just a pure Robert McKee golem, like has no interiority. He just exists <laughs> to like write scripts that He's are... He's adapter. Yeah. I mean, he does... He did the Ridley Scott Robin Hood, which I watched, which is like... Yeah. It also just seems like you get put in a lane of like you adapted one novel and everybody's like, great, you're the guy who adapts yeah, novels now. Exactly. He's also the, the guy they bring in to make the Wachowski script for Assassins worse. <laughs> That's the one with the, 
Antonio Banderas doing the the laptop gif, yep. you know, where he likes he likes what he sees on the computer. Oh, oh question. Is that 13 Assassins? No, it's just that different? It's just Assassins. Rocks. Yeah, that movie's cool. Yeah, 13 Assassins rocks, right? Oh, yeah. What if Antonio Banderas spoke Japanese <laughs> in a movie? Could what be if? good. Speaking of computers, is this the first film, Ian, you can maybe you can answer this. Is this the first film where we see Clint Eastwood operate a computer? No, in true crime, he is using Lexus Nexus famously. <sighs> Damn it. Yeah, but he does go to the extremely doing the same type of thing here. That's Just fair like to say. Looking something up. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to make it seem like he doesn't have his emails printed out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. By an assistant. So then we find out that so the, there's a the murder of Glory Torres and there's a murder of another man at a ATM, and it seems like it's the same killer. And it turns out so there's the whole three strikes thing where they think that this law, the the three strikes law is making otherwise nonviolent or less violent crimes turn into something you should you just decide to kill all the witnesses to so that you don't mm-hmm. go to jail an effect that it maybe did have in real life hard yeah. to observe precisely i was also looking into there obviously is a lot of racial disparity in the organ transplant system of course black and brown people disproportionately need kidney and heart transplants largely as a result of the environmental factors in the places where black and brown people are forced to live and then uh, wouldn't you know it but white people are more likely to get organ transplants Uh, black patients are left on dialysis longer than white patients and even though getting a kidney transplant leads to a longer average life expectancy this is uh, surprising to no one. What was surprising to me is that Michael Connolly made up fake acronym for the an yeah. organ. Yeah. Yep. Bopra. <laughs> he just made that up. That's not what it's called. Oh, you know, your Bopra. Yeah, the Bopra system. He hacked into the, the Bopra, Bopra database. Uh, so that's been compromised. My cousin is always asking me, like, if I want a taste of Bopra, if I, like, I uh, want to, do I smell yeah. Bopra? It's just a. Cousin's one of the funniest guys alive. It's a Bofa joke. I find. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that, but I feel like if like I, I'm trying to think of a member of my family where if they were murdered and their heart got put into any kind of investigator, if I would bother <laughs> ask for them to help me track down the killer, you know, I don't know. Do you, do you I think you would do this? Would you do it? Would you pull a Graciela Torres, Ian, Molly? Well, look, he says the thing about when you're doing the case, everything starts to feel like it's part of the case. Yeah, you start and, to feel uh, connected. Yeah. Yeah. So he's been running from that because it sucks you in so much, but got to go back. One last job. There, there's like throughout his filmography, there's this kind of um, ambivalence about connection and like social connection. I mean, I think it ties into the libertarian feeling the the kind of I don't need anybody, I don't want to rely on anybody, no one should rely on me thing. And I feel like Ian, tell me if I'm off base here, but the end of this film where they go to the or Clint goes to the the shipwreck where it turns out mm-hmm. Jeff Daniels has stashed Graciela and Raymond? Is that the kid's name? I think so. The kid's name Sounds can't right. be Raymond. Is it really Raymond? <laughs> Doesn't seem possible. You no, know, uh, when a child is named Raymond. Yeah, I mean, yeah. some of them have to be. One but... of the worst things that happened to him when he was a kid. <laughs> yeah, one of the top two worst things that happened to this kid. But he goes to the shipwreck, and then it feels like kind of a re- a return to the end of Magnum Force, where yes. Dirty Harry is on a He's similarly running through an empty ship. Empty ships. I'm I'm realizing very cinematic. I can't blame Clint for finding yeah, his course. way back here. Waterworld taught us this, but. He's now he's doing the same thing, except instead of being alone against this whole gang, it's it's Clint with now he's got like the family in tow. He's got the family unit Mm -hmm. and together they're escaping. And then he and Graciela both kill Buddy. Yes. In a pretty awful scene, Graciela holds his head underwater. So he drowns after he's been shot. But also, I feel like if someone is a serial killer who's expressly killed your sister to get her heart into the chest of the fbi man who he thinks he who he thinks is the batman to his joker Uh uh-huh i would be mad and might hold that person under water well i think we've said before that murder in the heat of passion to get what you perceive as justice for somebody you personally care about to me is much more defensible or at least understandable than police murder of of suspects so i understand why she might have yeah, no conviction in yeah. any court right <laughs> exactly <laughs> but yeah. i feel like there's this there's like a fusion of of this is when clint officially becomes mexican you know as he jokes at the end uh-huh. of the film like there's this fusion between him and the torres family 
in some sense. His body fully accepts the new organ. And that's why she holds Buddy's head underwater. I think he's in in a lot of these movies. I think he's trying to say in sometimes a very clumsy way, I'm not on the side of the oppressor. Right. You know? Yeah. I know I look like I'm yes. cool. the prototypical oppressor, but I'm the person who sees how fucked up everybody else is being. Yeah. And again, he's not like, let's go build a new society based on teamwork. It is very like every man for himself in this world. This movie does end on a kind of hopeful, yeah. connective note. His movies are, they don't generally have like depressing downer endings. No, yeah. Like a lot of them have a little kind of like, beam of sunlight right of like well he and that woman are gonna probably make nice, out yeah. yeah right and well but he he and the lady and raymond are on the boat and he says that he wishes he could put a big fat marlin on the line for raymond <laughs> which i think is like one of the most affecting fatherly mm, things i've ever yes. heard in my life maybe i'm that's true maybe i'm revealing too much about my own Although I, I had to do some research and I discovered the quantities of DDT that sit in the bottom of the Long Beach Palace Verdes uh, <laughs> they are truly incredible. It was the, there's this Montrose chemical company used to just dump their DDT. They were the number one DDT producer in the nation right into Palace Verdes. People I know were going to this like swimming hole over by JPL. Oh, you can't you know, go to the swimming hole. You yeah. gotta tell these people. You can't go in a Is swimming that the Devil's Gate Dam? Yeah, it's like first of all it's haunted. Can't yeah. go there. But there's like a reservoir. Like people kept going to. I mean, like look at this like cool hot spring. And I was like, do not. You yeah. cannot get in the water by JPL. Yeah, yeah. don't. They've been dumping rocket fuel in there yeah. for like a hundred years. I thought of a new motto for us, which is, of course, don't fish white croaker near Palos Verdes. That's just a little thing we could say in each episode. Hey, yeah, to sign off. Yeah. Remember, folks. Don't do it. Because I guess basically any fish that you fish there are decently dangerous. White croaker, for whatever reason, have 183 times the reference dose of carcinogens God. and illness causing <laughs> chemicals inside them because of this. Yeah. Folks, only take only take the regular dose of carcinogens, please. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Someone I know posted a, a crawfish that they saw in Echo Park Lake the other day because yeah. there's like invasive mm. crawfish in the oh, lake yeah. and the LA no, River. Thank you. And I was like, ooh, forbidden crawfish boy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look, it's for the it's for the environment. We got to be boiling these things. It's like a crawfish cull. But I, to return to your more important point, Jake, I will say that although I think the film is meant to be heartwarming, I think the unintentional message that actually the basically cop believes he's carrying the literal heart of the victim in him, which is motivating his actions. But in fact, mm -hmm. the entire conflict is a result of his existence. If he had died without the heart. Her sister would have lived. It's time for my big brain. Do it. Do it. It's time for my big brain reading, which I don't think is intentional, but there is there is something interesting here. So Buddy is this aging trust fund kid. Like he is decadent mm. capital, yes. right? He is okay. yeah. just money for money's sake. He lives on a boat, doesn't do anything, doesn't work. He's just, he is money. Who is literally like extracting the life essence of this woman of color. He's like extracting from an oppressed global mm -hmm. south mm -hmm. to keep the police state alive because he likes that it's alive and it makes him feel like he matters gives him some purpose some, yeah yeah i think it's interesting also that the actress who plays glory torres she's playing a mexican character but is filipino and so there's like uh, a colonialism on colonialism here going the on. The interchangeability uh -huh, for the United States. Yeah. And then he says to Terry, like, I gave you life. You need me. We're Kennedy and Oswald, which interestingly, those guys only interacted once. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. and then notably, but uh, then Clint <laughs> says, no, I'm not going to be part of this. We, we don't have we're not for like friendship ended with Buddy Noon. Mm hmm. My new best friend is the sister lady. But I don't know if that's true because he says no and then he shoots him in the heart like he's the cop. He, he explicitly makes reference to the shooting range target. Yeah. So obviously no one going to see this because Triple X was sold out uh -huh. is going to take that away from the film. But there is there is something interesting going on there to me, a guy with a Clint Eastwood podcast. <laughs> well, pretty good movie. Yeah. Came around by the end. I was like, this movie? It's pretty good. I'm glad to hear yeah. that. 
And I think to your to your point, Jake, which is a good reading. Don't believe that cops would actually opt for more criminals. I think they would unintentionally opt for more criminals. They do create more criminals all the time with their actions. But I think the problem is that they just don't believe that there's any other route through something like transformative justice or, or you know, better welfare state or anything that we might consider being an alternative to the carceral system. But I do think that the fact that we have here a cop fighting for a victim's rights and the only thing that can really help a victim's family is to see somebody dead. This is reaffirming mm-hmm. the most policed version of how we respond to right. harm in our community. Which is famously like so many times the families of people who have been murdered say like this is not what i want right but instead of that we get somebody who says this is the only thing i want this is the only way i'll be happy in fact it's worth me and my nephew being put in grave danger for you to pursue this person because this is how i will feel some sense of relief but i think the fact that cops opt for this is not because of some big brain thing i think i tend to prefer not to ascribe sinister plans when just incompetence and enjoyment of their position of power do enough to explain something and I think that's what we have here. Most cops that I've seen don't seem like they have the capacity for conspiracy, really. Right. Not. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in movies, they're always like weighing the consequences of their actions, right. yes. which is not what they do in real life. No, it's, yeah. it's not. No, it's usually just uh, the thing that scratches whatever itch they've developed since high school or because the other cops tell them to. Yeah. Well, it's like speaking of how comedians are often scary and cops Enemy of the Pod, Jay Johnston, who plays the the cop on the Sarah Silverman program. Mm-hmm. One of the actually a very informative joke to my like worldview. There's a scene where he pulls Sarah Silverman's character over and says, "Do you know why I'm standing here?" And she says, "Because you got all C's in high school." <laughs> it's a great joke. But in the book, there's a character named Keisha Russell who is Bosch's like the most friendly reporter to him at the L.A. Times, who is also like the most friendly reporter to McCaleb. So there's there's overlap even in this book where they don't meet. Yeah, now I want to read the book where they meet. Now I got to yeah. read, what is it called? A Darkness, a darkness. More Than Night. <laughs> a yeah. Darkness More Than Night. That sounds uh-huh. amazing. I mean, incredible title. I got like a, I got a Michael Connolly shelf and a half. It takes up more than a, than a shelf. Yeah, I was like, maybe I need to get into Bosch now. I'm ready. Get them all used for like $2. That's the yes. best thing about these. That's what I mean. That's what I was doing with Elmore Leonard too. I was just like, oh, it's good to like somebody who's written a thousand books that have been sold a billion times in paperback yeah. because then you can collect them easily. It's read any like library bookstore for 25 yeah. cents. They're extremely readable. I will say that Bosch season one opens with Bosch killing a potentially unarmed suspect, <laughs> uh, which was not great for me yeah. when I watched Bosch. But And then also the Lincoln lawyer, I thought, hey, let me give Lincoln lawyer a try. He's a defense lawyer. These are the oh, guys yeah. that I actually think may be doing good work sometimes. Um, huge spoiler. Turns out that a, a lot of these guys that they're defending are actually bad criminals. Oh, no. Darn. Yeah. I was on a Goodreads thread of earlier today of people who have sworn off Michael Connolly, because in a recent Lincoln Lawyer book, he throws out a potential juror for being a Trumpster, and they don't oh, want Michael Connolly boy. to get political in his He got books the woke about mind cops. virus, yeah. Michael Connolly. Michael Connolly has gone woke, and it's about time for him to go broke. <laughs> this guy who loves talking about the police more than yeah, maybe talking about how there are, there are lots of situations in which it's actually justified for the police to go outside of the <laughs> yeah. very loose codes that restrict them that barely restrain them yeah i keep almost saying that titus welliver who plays bosch is in mystic river because he's in gone baby gone and i'm like having mm. a hard time keeping those <laughs> movies controlling yourself uh, distinct yeah. in my head any uh sort of uh, concluding thoughts on it's a movie called blood work yeah blood work yeah fine a fine film it we is came around to it by the end i would watch 10 more of these. The truest thing that could be said. Like you would, yeah, this. I mean, it, it would be great to see Clint and Titus Welliver together, even though the, yeah. I don't think the ages match Darkness up. Darkness More Than Night. Darkness More Than Night coming to theaters <laughs> right after Juror Number yeah. 2. Let's get a SAG deal closed, guys. We've got to yeah. get Nicholas Holt. Oh, yeah. Holt. We yeah. haven't yeah. shouted Darkness out the WGA for yeah. absolutely bringing these fucks to their knees. Yeah. Yeah, also Michael Connolly was at the protests. Oh, I did not didn't see, see this. this. Was he? Yeah. Look at this reporting. Yeah, because Max cool. Silvestri posted that <laughs> oh, shit. he met Michael <laughs> Connolly and he was so <laughs> starstruck and excited. Um, 
Mike Connolly, Union Strong. Union Strong. Love it. But not the police union. Those uh-huh. don't count. No, yes, they're not real unions. Not a real union. Isn't it crazy that that guy can be the head of the United Auto Workers and be the leading political party in Ireland? <laughs> At the same time. Yeah. So Sean Fain. How, yeah. Similar Joe, name. Everybody. Friend Drescher? Yeah. Friend Drescher. Awesome. Yeah. The Friend awesome. Drescher party. Yeah. Yeah. Friend Drescher said food not bombs. Yeah. Friend Drescher seems weird cool. Yep. She seems, she's weird, a Malibu cool. lady. Oh, yeah. I profiled there you go. her once. I profiled her once and I was like, wow, surprisingly good labor politics. Mm. Pro Bernie. Grew up going to New York public schools, so she okay. has a strong sense uh-huh. of like social welfare. Yeah. Cool. And then she was like, let me call you back and tell you more stuff. And then she called me back and talked to me for an hour about how 5G causes brain cancer. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. You have to get rid of all the toxins in your house. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Because I've been working on that. it might be poisoning you. Did you mm-hmm. see the Naomi Wolf thing about how women she knows over 60 have been having menstrual cramps after sleeping in hotel rooms where vaccinated women have slept. Whoa. No, is that was like a recent uh, Naomi Wolf post. Havana syndrome for uh-huh. that's yeah, it's sounds, it sounds like yeah, it. yeah. Something like that. Pretty exciting yeah. stuff. We're learning new things every day. I love when somebody I think is smart turns out to be so insane. Yeah. Me too. Somebody that other people was like, that's a smart person. You can listen to them and then they're just like, just kidding. Speaking of which, Ian, you were going to say something. Uh, I don't, I don't put any kind of front on about, about being a smart person. Thank God. Yeah. What's on the package, baby? I just wanted to give a big salute to our friend Lenny Niehaus and his last Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Work. Oh yeah, he's moving on. Each say one of our favorite Lenny Niehaus notes. I think that could be really nice. Uh big fan of it's a classic G. It's a good pick. Good pick. <laughs> Uh, Ian, what about you? You like G? I like a F sharp. Yeah. Pretty close F's. to the G. That's yeah, you and I are we're right often next door. pretty close yeah. to each other. Uh, yeah. Speaking of, of Clint collaborators, Molly, we've been mm-hmm. sort of tracking the Mel Paso company that Family. Uh-huh. comes with Clint throughout his career. This is the, so the last film, Space Cowboys, was the final film with cinematographer Jack N. Green. This is the first film with Tom Stern, who is Clint's guy, going forward until just a few years ago, which is I mean, part he of slots why, right in. He does but I think the Clint this work. movie does look distinctly different. It looks, as you said, like more naturalistic. A little, I think that contributes to the workmanlike feel of this movie. Like it seems like he's not, he's just not showing off as much. Stern, like a lot of the the Clint guys, starts in like the crew so he's like a gaffer on honky tonk man like he's just been around cool. he's also in the lightning department or lightning the lightning department very exciting he's in the <laughs> lighting department uh, on sam fuller's white dog all the right moves which is the movie where you see most of tom cruise's penis sandra locks rat boy and impulse on impulse by the way he is credited as thomas iguana stern really disappointed mm. that he dropped that <laughs> would have been good yeah coward <laughs> he's trying uh, it out exactly uh-huh. the phantom a favorite film of mine American Beauty, Road to Perdition, and the RoboCop remake. He'll be Clint's go-to guy up through 1570 to Paris. And then more recently, he shot The Meg, which is one of the ugliest films I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and The Last Voyage of the Demeter, the, the Dracula boat movie, which looked pretty good. So okay. I don't know what's know going what on with get. this guy. Yeah, But also, Ian, I promised on Space Cowboys that I would get to the bottom of why the switch. Yes, so and? So in a... 2012 article in Esquire, the aforementioned Esquire magazine by Tom Genode, uh, called The Eastwood Conundrum, which was very helpfully reposted on the Clint Eastwood archive. Shout out to our, our pal Darren Allison over there. Jack Green started as a camera operator under uh, Bruce Surtees. One day, Surtees went to Eastwood and told him that Green was re- ready to take his job. Green began working as Eastwood cinematographer when Eastwood made Heartbreak Ridge. Eventually, he came to understand his boss so well that his boss barely needed to speak to him. He communicated instead by a series of hand gestures that Green then <laughs> interpreted for those who didn't understand. Green Whoa, stayed on the job cool. for 15 years until one day Eastwood called him into his office and explained that Tom Stern, who joined the crew as a gaffer 20 years earlier, was ready to take over. Green says he likes to move people up within the company when he knows they're ready, when he knows that they're ready, and that maybe somebody who is more mature is ready to move on and do other work. He wanted to give someone else a chance, and I think I was also getting a little expensive. All right. So no, yeah, yeah, no bad blood, no that no hard feelings. 
like what we understand also a lot of these you know joel cox whatever all these editors that come up and uh that's yeah, great they come and they go yeah much like the uh the beautiful blood that flows through that heart of <laughs> clint eastwood's in this i don't know true. I don't, yeah, beautiful blood uh-huh. beautiful uh-huh. blood we love it folks don't we get a heart transplant yeah what's your so molly would you say that your your favorite clint is midnight in the garden of good and evil or the classic yeah, i think it might be okay. actually I think personal, personal one I watch the most. I think it's a great movie. It is, it is great. It it's, is quite good. And I just have a personal preference for like a Nashville type ensemble. ensemble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those are, I mean, they're they're very rewatchable. Good, good actors, actors. Sort of new avenues each time. Yeah. We should say that that wasn't the end of Jack and Green's cinematography career, by the way. Of course, he goes on to shoot such films as Fifty First Dates, The 40-Year-Old Virgin, Are We Done Yet? And 2009's Oy Vey, My Son is Gay. <laughs> oh, those movies are all bright as hell. Yeah. yeah. Really brightly lit. Really brightly lit. Uh, doing Lainey Kazan no favors in uh, Oy Vey, My Son is Gay. Or uh, Oy vey. Br- Bruce Valanche is in it do? too. Sure. Why not? Well, that's about going to do it for our episode on blood work. Thanks again to Molly Lambert for joining us today. Been a been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Molly. It's our pleasure. What can I ask? Is the name of the cat that I've seen behind you in the on the camera here? Oh, me personally. Yes. Yeah. There's a cat. Get his ass. Oh, baby. Oh yeah. There's two cats. This one's Wheezy. There's also Ooh. a gray cat. I saw there's also an orange cat over at. Oh, uh, Ian's got a. Yeah. Ian's. I got a couple. I got two orange. Two orange. That yeah, was Tita, who made a little appearance, was slapping the mic. That's, yeah. that's the reason my mic sounds all fucked up and everything I said was really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She was biting you and making you uh, say bad stuff. Yeah, making yeah. you do stuff. Making you defend blood work. That's, yeah, of course. <laughs> it may be tox- toxoplasmosis that's caused me to not understand what's good and what's bad anymore. That's, yeah. <laughs> it's from uh, how dutifully you're scooping the litter box. Uh, yep. Molly, can you tell us a little bit about anything you're working on right now that's cool? Anything folks should check out? Sure. I have another project coming up that's uh, sort of in the same, in, in the way that Bosch and Bloodwork are in the same universe. It's in the same universe as Heidi World. Cool. Um, it's about the porn industry in the valley in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and cool. Jenna Jameson. Boogie Nights and, 2. Yeah, Boogie Nights 2 about the collapse of porn into streaming in advance of the collapse of everything into streaming interesting so cool get ready do you is that like a next year thing yeah cool I'm writing it okay I'm, I'm, I'm in it now but yeah you can find me on instagram molly underscore lambert for now a great instagram chronicler of the city of los angeles i always love the the weird building posts on on instagram so thank you for those for those who haven't listened, Heidi World, of course, a little bit different than Clean Eastwood Films, does explain a lot of actual analysis about the social conditions and <laughs> yeah. fully is a little bit more coherent yeah. about critiquing both high level and individual level stuff. Uh, whereas, not to say Clint doesn't do that, it's just kind yeah. of a just a smorgasbord. You don't really know where anything yeah. fits together. Not the case with your wonderful podcast. Look, I'm ready to sell out and make Unforgiven. <laughs> yeah, go right. for it. I mean, unlike sure. this podcast, yeah. also Heidi World is uh, edited, uh, which is a point <laughs> in its favor. And uh, the aforementioned Max Silvestri does uh, a Hungarian accent as uh, Yvonne Naj. So that's wonderful to listen to. Yeah, he was fantastic and, and the big, truly the biggest Bosch head I've ever known. So okay. excited. Uh, Maybe I'm going to read some, uh, what's his name? Caleb Mc... Terry McCaleb. Terry McCaleb. McCaleb was Michael Connolly's, Michael Connolly's uh, wife's maiden name. So it's actually very sweet. Mm. Or he's just yeah, uh, lazy. The only Irish in all of Los Well, Molly, let me know if you need to borrow any any Connolly books. I got I Yeah, got maybe I will. <laughs> Loading library. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks cool. for having me. Yeah, thanks Thank for, being for being here. With us. Yeah. We got one more, one more game of... Uh, the stupid AI thing to play. So, oh yeah. Well, do you want to great. talk about next week? We're going to be talking about Mystic River. Where can you find it? Next week, we're going to talk about Mystic River. Where can you find it? You can find it in the regular places, unless you're in Mexico, in which case, Ian, what do we got? We can find it for free streaming on the Cursed Max. Also, Claro Video, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Apple TV. Now, down there, they they call it Manzon TV. This is, uh, speaking of Hungarians, Manzon hmm. TV. sort of playing on the blood theme. Manzon wow. TV. I've got no 
no Dracula? landmarks. It's actually good <laughs> related, to, related to Dracula. Mine's on the TV. This is Count Von Count, supposedly. Oh. Wow. Okay. A famous wow. Count. Really Sounds a little good. like Dr. Yeah. Phil, gotta yeah. say. Mine's oh. on the TV. Yeah. And also he says VV, but I don't know. That's, you know, it's a it's a free Could website. what they do. Yeah. It's yeah. a free podcast. Yeah. You you know, uh-huh. keep it to yourselves, everybody. Uh, thanks for listening, folks. And uh, Molly, thanks for being here. Thank you, Molly. Thanks for having me. And uh, remember to subscribe, rate us, write a review. It helps us on the algo. If you like the show, tell a friend, tell your dad, email a link to your old boss, become intertwined with the career of a local police detective and leave him clues uh, leading to oh. podcast. For me. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Podcasty for me. If you have any comments, questions or concerns, or you're interested in co-hosting a two-person Clint Eastwood podcast, you can email us at Podcasty for me at gmail.com. Thank you to Jeremy Allison for our artwork. That's basically all we have to say. Oh, and um, uh, we didn't want to bother our guest with this bullshit, so we've recorded a, separately recorded a clip of me opening the birthday present that Ian sent to me. That's right. We will throw that now. Take it away, us. Do 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 do. Come on, just kidding. Wow, that was crazy. That scared me so much. <laughs> yeah. It's your. Big friends, Jake and Ian from the That's show. All right. Oh, can you feel a different energy? This is like a secret yeah. episode. Speaking of feeling energies, did you see what I texted you? It was a link to an Instagram post of Comrade Francis Fisher on the SAG picket line with who else but Marianne Big Williams. Dubs. And... Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know what? Girlfriend. These fat cat studio heads haven't been listening to any other type of traditional energies such as yelling that's, so that's a good maybe point. we need to bring in and some new energies we need to uh remove their throat chakras <laughs> with like a like mortal combat style move anyway we're here just the two lads because ian sent me a birthday present i i wanted to open it on the pod because i he saw his birthday present on the podcast i did i, did. I gotta ask you this is a physical package uh-huh. I'm crumple, crimp, crimpling it into the bag. I, just to clarify, is any part of Scorpio Killer portrayer <laughs> Andrew Robinson in this package? Yes, uh, but we have to wait to find out which one. You did it's just hair. Re- if it was hair, it would... as requested. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, so a little background. Ian told me, you know, your your gifts in the mail. It'll be there, you know, in the next couple of days or whatever. And so I'm. Um, looking for it i'm a little worried because i don't see it and then i there's a pack i get a notice that like a package has been delivered and i am excited i go downstairs and i pick it up and it's like you know gum or whatever i have a i have a orbits sweet mint on subscribe and save from amazon and uh there's also a package there for a name i don't recognize at my address i presume just the person who used to live here i'm not sure what to do with that I, i'm on my way to work or whatever i i leave the package is here for a long time a couple days before I realize Jag Sherwood. Oh, Ian has done a little joke on my name. Like when I will send him a package addressed to like Evan Rend or whatever. Imagine if you had just slam dunked it right into the trash and just said, I (laughs) guess Ian lied about the gift. (laughs) So that's cool. It would have been cool. It would have been cool if I slam dunked really anything. Yeah. God, imagine I hosted a podcast with a guy who could slam dunk. What a life I would lead. That would be cool. Have I told you that I've been getting back into Shaq's rap career, rap music? No. Yeah. Shaq is actually a pretty good rapper. I've heard this on the Flagrant Ones basketball podcast. They, I think, make the same assessment. Are they? Are the Flagrant Ones doing a basketball podcast now? Fuck you. Let me open this (laughs) gift you sent me. All right. I'm using a scissor. All right. While he's opening it, I will say that the other main gift I considered was a Space Cowboys, which is a minor league Texas baseball team. Ooh. Jersey. I guess there's a real MLB player, people who like baseball, maybe know Jolks. Jolks used to play on the Space Cowboys, who were pretty We got a lot of those on the podcast. We do. Yeah, this is why I thought it'd be cool for you to have a, a one that says Jolks. That said, it said Jolks on the back and Space Cowboys on the front. I've Unfortunately, whatever I'm about to pull out of this package has a huge <laughs> bar to clear. All right. Well, let me just add that I the reason the main reason that I decided not to buy it for you was because it was an XL. Oh, now I would like okay. you to open the package. 
We've got... What are we looking at? Oh, shit! Tell us what you're seeing. This is a a gorgeous vintage triple XL <laughs> fruit of the loom fridges of Madison County promotional sweatshirt. That's so right. that's a right. wonderful joke you've pulled that the reason yeah. you didn't get me the XL is because I needed a triple X. Uh-huh. And uh, for any of our listeners out there who are uh, people of size, uh, know that absolutely Ian not the is joke. Doing this I am trip. certain that's how it comes across. This kind of looks like a child's triple x too this is what i thought was really funny about it is that i did ultimately accept the fact that it was much bigger than the jersey i was going to get you but then i checked the measurements themselves had to look up like sweater measurements took me to some type of italian website i don't like those love those oh what i discovered is that it is basically like a medium or a large length in sweater and it is a double xl in width of sweater like shoulder to shoulder this is probably my dream sweatshirt (laughs) because i find that i want them to be a little baggy but Mm. then they're always very long and it looks like i'm wearing some kind of a a, a misbegotten dress from like 2008 well i did try to convince myself that this would be an okay gift by searching something like oversized sweatshirt fashion style or whatever (laughs) and all of them (laughs) were young women wearing extremely lengthy sweaters dress style as you described so i said okay this is not a and this is not one of those italian websites you're looking at <laughs> no italian google yeah did i send you the uh the guy i was looking at an interview i was looking at video interviews with rade serbija to try to mm. figure out how to pronounce his name properly and wanted to give yep. the man some respect this was for our uh, space cowboys episode and found a Serbian talk show that he was on. I figured, great, I won't understand any of this except when the guy says his name and then I'll know how to say it perfectly. Of course. Um, and so I looked this up and I saw the this is a Serbian talk show host who is, I got to say, the most upsetting looking man of all <laughs> no. time. Let me pull him up now, actually. Okay. This is a traditional video style talk show, not a radio talk yeah, show. Yeah, this is on YouTube. And let me be clear. Hmm. Let me be clear. The upsettingness of the man's face is almost entirely of his own doing. This is a medically, this is a a elective induced, uh huh, elective induced bad looking. Did you hear my little uh, screen grab noise? No, is that coming through? Oh, I thought that'd be good radio. Let me get you a couple angles. And it's not just elective surgically. He's also accessorized in many a bad way. Great. It also says, I guess because of how Serbian grammar works, it seems like it is referring to an actor or comparing him or something in the the title of the video, but it does say Al Pacinom. Cool. Oh, wow. They have some type of... All right. I'm sending you some of these... Ablative declension. That's like a... Well, I was going to say that's probably his kind of uh, Mr. Beast Burger ghost kitchen venture, oh. Al Pacinoms. <laughs> All right. Look, get a load of this guy. Oh, baby. So this guy, I could only describe as, oh, man, one of these photos is really bad. He looks like the wax figure of a Czech soccer player. <laughs> we're we're uh, so blessed to be in the realm of ethnic groups. Oh, it's kind of God okay to make man. fun of. Is this... I How cool is this, this to that, that season two? Have you seen Atlanta, the TV show of Atlanta? You don't like yeah. TV famously. I know. I know what you're talking Teddy about. Perkins, Te- Teddy Perkins. Teddy, Teddy Ruxpin or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. He looks different than that because that guy mercifully looks like he has a bunch of prosthetics on his face. And this guy, there's no, no room. He kind of looks like a yossified Dolph Lundgren. That's true. With He's got this the hyper thin nose. Yeah, he's got a real nose job nose. He's got a real everything else job, everything else. He's got, I would say, eyebrow influencer eyebrows from a couple years ago, like a few rounds of eyebrow styling back. He's got these big green screened books behind him that are way too large. Yeah. And they're all, all of it is really yeah. wonderful. He's got, are the, I can't tell if they're very gentle gauged earrings or just like studs that are too big, but he looks also like he's can't got... Tell. He looks like he's got buttons on his ears that could be affixed to something. A fine suit jacket. And a mustache that is villainous. The haircut, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, is very soccer player. Um, I'm going to find out what this guy's name is. Hold on. His name is... 
I'm going to guess Nevin Siganovich. Mm, Siganovich. Interesting. This was posted two months ago, this video. And he is currently, let's guess the man's age. Ooh. Is this a real photo? Because he does just look like the Giga Chad filter a little bit. <laughs> he does. I think tragically to me, this is a type of work having been done that ages people tremendously. So I actually believe this man is 14 years old. He is 53. Oh, wow. Cool. Okay, this one is a little bit Mickey Rourke in Iron Man 2 to me. Yeah, my board. <laughs> Where is my board? <laughs> He's also starting to look a little bit like Robert Zadar in some of these pictures. Yeah. He has a bunch of tattoos on his chest of uh, like lipstick kisses. Yeah, he sure does. It. Oh, shit. Okay, so here's an English headline. He went in for a nose job and came out with a permanent erection. A Croatian reality star traveled to Iran for a nose job and ended up in the emergency room for an unexpected side effect. Well, you know, some of these, uh, I, I live in Los Angeles. I'm, no, I'm, I'm uh, certainly not unfamiliar with some of the, the great Persian American plastic surgeons who have billboards around here. Some of those fellas, they'll give you, they'll give you a bit of a physiological <laughs> response. You think that They're was the problem? Guys. Yeah. Too, many, too many studs in this office. And I look, I don't want to cross over into territory where we're just uh, we would never cross over into territory, especially down in the Balkan states. Yeah, it's yeah. very difficult to cross over territory there. Damn. So our new favorite guy is Nevin Siganovich. Come on the show, Nevin. It reminds me fondly of the time that I lived at the Nevin stop in Brooklyn, New York City. New York. Speaking of New York, it's as if this man went into a plastic surgeon for one part of his face and the other parts of his face said you mess with one of us you mess with all of us <laughs> and the surgeon obliged <laughs> quite a bit like that yeah that's true well anyway thank you so much for the birthday gift bridges of madison county sweatshirt you're so welcome i did set some criteria for myself that i wanted it to be to be look cool I yeah also it, does, wanted it, it is look cool to not be a new piece of trash that was produced for the earth only because I ordered it. I appreciate that sincerely. Lightly used, which means that you can kind of wear it or not wear it as much as you want. It was right. it moved from one house to another house, and that's yeah. Fine. We're talking we're talking you know transit emissions only, and I'm sure most of those were on trucks that had other stuff in them too. Yep, perhaps even that self same gum true at a certain point we'd like to hope that they their paths converged remember when the the carol striken from twin peaks he says that self same gum you like is coming back into style <laughs> yeah i think he just says gum anyway uh thanks ian all right bing bong bong bye everyone bye